Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric D'Souza, and welcome to our continuing series of author interviews of Prime Writers of Canada members who have been shortlisted for the Award of Excellence. Joining me today is Lorna Poplack, who's, who wrote The Dawn, the story of Toronto's infamous jail, published by Dundurn Press and nominated for the Brass Knuckles Award for Best Nonfiction Crime Book, sponsored by Simpsons and Wellenbreaker, LLP. Uh, welcome, Lorna. How are you today? Fine, Eric. Thanks for inviting me to the session. You're welcome. And, and just hearing you mention the name of that award, the Brass Knuckles Award, just makes me smile because it is such a great name for an award. <laughs> it is a great name. Um, uh, so I was reading your bio on your website, uh, and you've been writing for many years, tried your hands in any genre, um, and for a while, uh, a children's author. Um, I even read that uh, while you were workshopping your first book, uh, Drop Dead, A Horrible History of Hanging in Canada, you envisioned it for an audience of young readers. Um, but your publishers directed you to publish the work as adult nonfiction. So what draws you to nonfiction? Why do you, why do you enjoy writing? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Oh, I was asking what draws you to nonfiction? What drew me to nonfiction? Yeah. Um, you know, as you saw in my, on my website, my background is my academic background was in French and English literature. And um, also I studied law at university and I became a, a librarian. So I was very much rooted in nonfiction at that point. But when I came to uh, desiring to write books or, or anything, I was drawn to nonfiction. And my passion at that point, as, as my website so clearly states, was for children's literature. So on coming to Canada, I was, uh, I, I originated, I was born in South Africa. On coming to Canada, uh, I started working, trying to get published as an author, and I was writing fiction, fiction for kids. My target mm -hmm. audience was eight to 12 year olds. And I tried for a number of years and these books went nowhere. So I've got about three or four children's books moldering somewhere, somewhere on my computer, having gone nowhere. So when it really hadn't gone nowhere, anywhere, uh, by the time uh, 2015 rolled around, I thought to myself, um, I, I need to find another path if I want to be published. And at that point, I remembered my roots and I thought, well, you know, I'm used to analysis. I enjoy analysis, I enjoy research. So, you know, th let's give it a try. And at that point I had become interested in uh, promoting this particular book and working on this particular book, which was uh, ended up being called Drop Dead, A Horrible History of Hanging in Canada. And um, I was promoting it as a kid's book. And I got in touch with Dundurn and I, plugged this to Dundurn and they came back to me and said they were very interested, but not as a kid's book. They did not do nonfiction for kids. They offered me a contract as an adult writer to write an adult nonfiction book. Well, you know, after I'd taken a few deep breaths, I thought to myself, well, yes, you know, why not? You know, it, it's just, let's give it a go. And that's exactly what I did. I gave it a go. And um, it was totally liberating because it opened things up for me. It enabled me to go much deeper and wider into my subjects. And um, I rediscovered what I really love doing, and that's research and writing nonfiction. I mean, uh, to sit in the middle of the night and, and discover a, a snippet of information that I that hadn't crossed my my uh, my desk before is just you know it, it's so exciting. So I find it very exciting to write nonfiction. I find it very exciting to um, present nonfiction in such a way that makes it readable mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, that, that people will connect to. So, you know, I don't go for these academic treatises. I go for um, acceptable stories that people can read and enjoy. For, you know, I, I, I would love to read your, your original draft of the kid's book of hanging in Canada. Yeah, I've got that, so I've got that in a folder somewhere as well, I can assure you. Never to be resuscitated. I think Dundon did you right. Uh, well, let's talk about this book then, The Dawn, uh, the story of Toronto's infamous jail, which I'm assuming is your backdrop. Uh, what inspired you to write about this jail? 
Yeah, that is my backdrop. Uh, you know, I'd love people to um, imagine this is where I actually live, but it's not. <laughs> this is a Don Jail, which is now um, the administrative building for Bridgepoint Hospital. So the, the building that you see behind me, the, the old building is the Don Jail. And the one you see to the side is the, the new Bridgepoint Hospital. So what inspired me to write about the Don Jail? Um, it was really while I was writing Drop Dead that I became interested in the jail because um, the Don Jail was actually a hanging jail. 34 people, men, 34 men were hanged there in the um, 90 years between 1872 and um, 1962. And the last two hangings in Canada ever took place at the Don Jail in, in 1962. Um, those were um, the hangings of, um, of, of Turpin and Lucas, Ronald Turpin and Arthur Lucas. So the Don Jail came up when I was uh, mm -hmm. researching Drop Dead. And um, not only from the hanging point of view, but also because I decided in Drop Dead to introduce a chapter on um, what I call my bricks and mortar characters. So there were three bricks and mortar characters, three jails who had served really as, um, as hanging places uh, during those terrible times. But the standout of all of, in all of them was the Don Jail. As I mentioned, 30, 34 hangings took place there. And um, there were just so many stories. And when I did my original research, I found just such fascinating information about the Don Jail. Um, I, I found out, for example, that um, in the 1860s, when the Don Jail uh, was built, there were new correctional ideas and philosophies. Uh, they were sweeping the globe. And a lot of them had originated with the writings of John Howard. In, a, in 1777, he'd written a book on the state of the prisons um, in England and Wales. And the conditions were too terrible. And he, uh, he promoted sweeping changes to the conditions of prisoners and the, the architecture of jails. And this was adopted, his, his writings and the writings of others were adopted worldwide. So that I discovered. I also discovered um, fascinating information about the location of the jail on the east side of the Don River. Uh, that was away from the city. The city at that point was on the, on the west side. So the Don jail, the jail was built on the east side. So, so why was that? I also read about the architect. I found out about, about the architect, whose name was William Thomas, and he died uh, during the course of, uh, of the, the jail being built. And the building took six years to complete. And two years after William Thomas died in 1860, the jail suffered a devastating fire, which gutted the central building. That's the building that you can see behind my head. Uh, mm -hmm. The wings were where the, the jail, the cells were, but the administrative building is the main sort of that large section in the middle. So a terrible fire. And, you know, I really wanted to know about the fire, what had caused it. The insurance didn't cover, the insurance money didn't cover the rebuild. So there were all these fascinating bits of information floating around, and I really wanted to corral them all. And I decided that when I had the opportunity, I would revisit and I would you know, sort of, if possible, write something. And um, when the jail finally opened, which was in 1864, it was hailed as a palace for prisoners. So I wanted to know why this palace for prisoners built on these wonderful um, penal philosophies, you know, the, the forefront of penal philosophy of the time, what had happened, why it had become so terrible and why it became tainted. So um, that really was, was what pro propelled me initially to look at the Don Jail. And then, of course, I happened to speak to somebody at Dundurn to, um, to, to you know, they, they asked me if I was writing anything. And I said I was. And then Catherine Lane um, sort of, I, I suggested to her that this was what I was writing on. And she was very enthusiastic. So um, that's how this book came about. It does sound like there's a lot of stories that you uh, tell in the book. Um, actually, just to read your blurb, uh, The Dawn is a saga of the people who interacted with the historic jail during the 150 plus years of existence. Um, I guess it includes stories from inmates, guards, governors, gangs, officials, and even a pair of star-crossed lovers. So it must be filled with stories. 
Yes, so um, it, it is a story of a building. So obviously I go into the architecture of the building and I go into what happened to it, but it, it's the stories that really are important to me. And in fact, one of the first stories, you mentioned the star-crossed lovers. So that was one of the first stories that I did research and I wrote about. And this was um, this, the story of um, Frank McCulloch and Vera de Lavelle. And they were lovers and their story unfolded, I mean, literally in the shadow of the gallows. So let me tell you a little bit about Frank and Vera. Uh, Frank was a, an immigrant from the States and, and he wasn't one of those immigrants that, uh, you know, sort of really get accepted into a country. He was a, a ne'er-do-well. And he was um, uh, sort of pursued by the police who were trying to get him for uh, trying to sell some suspicious merchandise in Toronto. And uh, in the course of a, a melee with a police officer, he shot and killed the police officer. This happened in, in uh, 1918. So Frank was taken into captivity and um, he was tried and he was uh, accused and, and convicted of murder. Now, this is very serious because murder, you know, as, as I write um, so graphically in Drop Dead, murder was. Uh, was the most serious crime of all and the punishment was the most serious punishment of all and that was death by hanging so frank was taken into the don jail and he was to await his day uh, his time his date to meet the hangman which was in may 1918 and as it turned out he was just such a charming person he just he was so charming and disarming he sort of twisted the guards who were supposed to take care of him. He had three guards uh, sort of taking care of him, looking, they called them the night watchmen. Mm -hmm. So there were three of them taking shifts to make sure that he was okay, didn't commit suicide, and, you know, he, was, he, he could face his hanging when the time rolled round. But he twisted them around his little finger. Yeah. And they were bringing him things, they were smuggling things into the jail, food and, and other items. And, uh, you know, he, he was sort of lording it in the jail, in the death cell. And one of the things that they smuggled in was a saw, which he used to cut through the bars. And three weeks before he was supposed to meet the hangman, he escaped. And uh, in a subsequent investigation, it was found that Vera, Vera de la Velle, who was his lady love, had um, given a saw hidden, I think it was in a box of chocolates. Yep, it was in a box of chocolates to one of the guards who brought it in and um, he, he used the saw to escape. So Vera was subsequently captured and she was brought to the Don Jail and she was looking at about seven years for having aided and abetted his escape. But meanwhile, Frank escaped. He escaped from the jail. And um, he was, uh, his time, his, his, he was supposed to be um, hanged on the, on the 2nd of May, the time came and went, and he was captured about a week later, and a new date was set in June, and after he'd been brought back into captivity, Vera escaped. So this was very embarrassing. It was very embarrassing. There was total chaos in the jail. And, um, you know, two of them, the, the, the man and his lover, both escaping with a, within a few weeks of each other, you know, the, the press just went wild and so did the authorities. So um, ultimately Frank was hanged and Vera was uh, found and, and captured after that. And um, she served, I think just about two months it was, uh, uh, sort of concurrent sentences for the part that she played, and then she disappeared. So literally, uh, you know, it, it was a very moving story because um, maybe in another time, another place, Frank might not have been accused and convicted of murder because he had been, uh, he had been fighting with the police officer and um, it, it might have been sort of self-defense on his part rather than, than, than murder. Anyway, you know, that was the story of Frank and Vera. So it was a very poignant story I found. Uh, it almost sounds stranger than fiction, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And a lot of these stories are. A lot of these you, stories are. If you pitch it to me as fiction, I'd be like, no, nobody can see it that much. <laughs> um, 
I can tell you're a great storyteller, Lorna. So uh, anybody wants to read all the stories of the dawn, uh, they should pick it up through Dundon Press. Um, you have a couple of events coming up. Um, I wanted to talk about the uh, Maple Leaf uh, panel that you're on, uh, because I, I think I'll be working in the background for that. So uh, you're on a panel called uh, It Really Happened. Yes. What's, what's, what's going to be talked about? Well, this this is going to be great. Uh, and what's really exciting about it is it's happening on the first day of mm -hmm. the um, conference. You know, usually the um, sort of uh, true crime is, is relegated to the, the, the sort of back end of things. But here it's really in the foreground, mm -hmm. front and center. So that's very exciting. So uh, the panel is being moderated by Des Ryan. Um, I, you know him well, I know, and um, I, I have been on panels with him before. And the other panelists are Nate Hendley, who I've also served on a panel with, and uh, Susan Goldenberg. And uh, this panel is all about true crime stories from Canada and around the world. And the focus here is on cold cases, unsolved murders, killers and monsters, gangsters, and the havoc they create. So that's how it's described, the panel is described. So it should be very interesting and, you know, maybe not too gruesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'll actually be working in the uh, background checking the panel. So you'll see me in the uh, backstage, <laughs> virtually backstage. <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, next Tuesday evening, 8.15 Eastern Standard Time. Um, actually, your opening act is Maureen Jennings. <laughs> All right. Yes, yeah. so that, that's a hard. That's a hard. Yeah. Right. yeah. Who wants to follow that? So yeah. that should be really good. So anybody watching, that's the Maple Leaf Mystery Conference, uh, and Primaries of Canada is actually uh, sponsoring the event, so it should be a lot of fun. Um, or not, it was a great pleasure meeting you and talking with you. Um, good luck on May twenty sixth. Thank you very much. And, and uh, as yeah, I say, lovely, lovely to have this conversation with you. Thank you, and thank you very much for listening. Okay, thanks so much, Eric. Bye yeah. for now. Bye-bye.